I think we might go ahead and get started if that's all right with you. So the lesson tonight we're going to be talking about comes from Acts chapter 9, and we'll, the, what I'm, we're going to read several verses of Scripture, but we're going to finally get down to the point that we're talking about a church that was at peace. And that becomes pretty important because I would generally say we're pretty much at peace, and so what can we learn from the church when it was at peace? How does that apply to us, and what things are there that will help us as we try to move the Christian life as, as the church? So let me start in Acts chapter 9 and verse 19, latter part of verse 19, if you want to follow along or you can just follow with me here, it's projected. So this talks about Saul beginning to preach. You know, before Saul, we find that uh, he was heavily involved, at least it appears to be, persecuting the church. And he'd even gone to Damascus to see if he could find Christians, take them back to Jerusalem, put them, put them in prison. So he was really, uh, I think he was probably one of the big instigators of the, the, the persecution that the church, the church experienced. But then, after he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was uh, told what to do for the forgiveness of his sins by Ananias, he did that. And so, with the same level of persecution he had, then he began to focus his attention on serving Jesus Christ and doing what he could as best he could, I believe. So as we begin to read, then this talks about Saul beginning to preach Christ. So now for several days he was with the disciples who were at D Damascus. This is after he had been converted, if you would. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed, and they were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name? And who has come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? That's what people were saying, what they were thinking. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But the disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And when he'd come to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he, had, that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, Barnabas is a guy of rather extraordinary capabilities, I think, in dealing with people to encourage people. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked, and that he had talked to him, Jesus had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. So uh, Barnabas took Saul, if you would, took him to the apostles, and uh, they seemed to accept him okay. And so then Paul, Saul had opportunity to be about active in Jerusalem, preaching the word, preaching boldly the name of Jesus. And uh, he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, and they were attempting to put him to death. It seemed like wherever he goes, he's going to be in trouble because there's a lot of people don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. And certainly at that time, was, that was true. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. And look at the results. And the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. So... Uh, when we see then that the church, we know about the church, the apostles preaching in uh, Judea, Jerusalem and Judea. We know about Philip going to uh, Samaria to preach, but this is the first time I believe in the New Testament we see that the church in Galilee is beginning to grow. And so I would, so I would suggest to you when those that were scattered about uh, because of the persecution that arose, Acts chapter 8 verse 4, they began to spread in different directions, and the church really began to grow in different directions. 
So now when I begin to look at this, well, seems like I don't know what the problem the Jews had, but they must have had something else that distracted their attention, really. Saul was no longer there to keep them stirred up, or some of them stirred up. So what we see then is the church in these, this various region of Palestine. They were enjoying peace. Now that seems to be rather unusual in my understanding of the scriptures uh, about the churches. We see that there be times of peace, and then there's times of turmoil, and there's times of internal turmoil, I suppose. So, but look at the characteristics of what we see. They enjoyed peace. What was happening? Well, they were being built up. They were going on in the fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and so the church continued to increase. So when we talk about the church throughout all Judea and Samaria enjoying peace, when we look at peace, peace could refer not only to the absence of hostility, strife, or disorder, but also to a condition and sense of being safe and secure. So I think those are kind of a general definition of peace as I would understand it. So when we learn that the church had the church, uh, the various churches in Palestine, they had peace. What can we learn from what they experienced? Well, first of all, it says they were built up. They were built up, or edification is another word that we frequently use sometimes when we look at the scriptures, but it includes encouragement. Though with the edification, the focus falls on the goal of being established in the faith. So when we talk about edification, there is a goal for which we are pursuing. And I believe that's the point that I think would be important to us. So we have a goal. It's not just being edified, but there is a goal that associated with that. So after, uh, in Colossians chapter 2, after having received Jesus Christ as the Lord, he told them, to, uh, Paul told him to walk in Him. And then he says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him, established in your faith just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. So one of the goals, I would say, in establishing your faith is we might be firmly rooted. How do we become firmly rooted? We get into the Scriptures as much as we can. I believe that helps us a great deal. So if we're firmly rooted and then we're built up in Him, that establishes our faith, helps to establish our faith for sure. Or another point we could look at related to that, uh, talk about equipping of the saints for the work of service for the building up of the church, or it talks about here obtaining unity of faith and knowledge and maturity in the full measure of Christ. So Ephesians chapter 4, we see that there's instructions given to certain ones in the church that are leaders, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but he says we ought to be, everybody ought to be pressing towards that goal of being edified so that we're strengthened with a goal to, to mature it in Christ. He says, until we all attain the unity of faith. Is there unity of faith in the Christendom, if you would, today? Well, not really. Is there unity in faith even among some of the churches of Christ? I think there's kind of some going this way and some are going this way a little bit more. And uh, sometimes we don't get together much. And so uh, that's really kind of a concern today. There are some churches that I've read about even changing their name so they're not Church of Christ anymore. I find it really hard to believe that would, that would be a difficult name to go by. It would never be difficult for me to understand anyhow. So they were pursuing unity of the faith, and knowledge, I believe, is a key, really, of the Son of God. That becomes really important for us. So that leads us to spiritual maturity to be more like Christ. That's a goal, I think, that we ought to be working towards. So the goal of maturity of faith prepares us to help others. So we're mature, we're growing toward maturity, but we have a purpose in that. And one of those purposes is, it says in verse Romans 15, verses uh, 1 and 2, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those who are without strength, and not just to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. Who would be weak in faith? Who would be weak? Anybody? 
Well, something comes to my mind. What about somebody just be becomes baptized and they become a new Christian? Couldn't they, lead a, couldn't they use a lot of encouragement? I, I generally think, to a large degree, we just kind of say, well, you're probably just about as strong faith as I have, and so you just go on and do your thing, and I'll do my thing. And Sometimes we think of that. There are some people in this congregation that are really loving people and reaching out and caring, so I see that demonstrated. So we'll help those that are without strength, not just to please ourselves. Dayton, please. Yeah, it, that's really a true point. Uh, how many of you sitting here tonight know members of the church that you've known over the years that still live here that don't come anymore? You see? So there are, there are a variety of folks that have weaknesses, I think, and uh, dull of hearing is what Dayton has said, and that's, that's a very important point. But each of us ought to be focused on trying to please his neighbor for his good to, to his edification. You know, you can't help, do, you can't help anybody in isolation. Have you ever thought about that? You can't do it. Now you can, might could say, well, uh, you know, somebody else can take care of that. Uh, you know, I'm not very good at that. Uh, I don't really believe that's a very satisfactory answer. It, it's not between me and you. It's between you and God. It's between me and God with my effort. And so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort that we... We ought to be careful and make sure we put it to use. So we're trying to edify one another. We're trying to encourage. We're trying to help one another, help those that are weak in faith and have weaknesses, weaknesses, and we can do that. So it's just important that we keep ourselves focused to do that. Now, when we talk about edification, there are special responsibilities given to some of the church leaders. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11 and 12, it says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. For what purpose? For the equipping of the saints, for the working of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. And so there is a reason that we have, we don't have apostles today, but we, and prophets most of the time, I think uh, that probably these gifts were given to individuals Probably the apostles laid their hands on them when the church was started, but these uh, we don't have we don't have prophets that speak the inspiration of God, but we do have preachers, and we do have evangelists, and we do have teachers. Those gifts, some of those gifts, carry on today, and they they can be just as active as we'll choose to let them be active. So all of this activity, though, is for building up of the body of Christ. That has got to be our focus, I believe, in our life serving Jesus Christ. So I think one other point that, come, that, that would be reasonable to talk about is with responsibility comes uh, authority. And so Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, says, For this reason I am writing these things while absent, so that when I am present I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for the building up and not for the tearing down. I believe elders are given some authority to help encourage people. And you can't encourage people, you know, it's really important to try to encourage people to encourage people. Encourage people that have skills to build up people that don't have the skills. And so I think that becomes a really important category. So uh, the elders, I believe, have responsibility. Preachers are to preach the word, speak the word, speak the truth to us. You may not be too happy to hear it sometimes. Most of the times I think what we hear is, is pretty encouraging. Uh, I think that's pretty important. <clears throat> With heaven as our goal, we are to therefore encourage one another and building up one another just as you also are doing. So he's encouraging the church at the Thessalonian church to continue to do that. Building up one another. That's got to be an important point. If it's going to be a church at peace, if we're going to try to pursue what the Bible teaches about peace, I believe that's got to be an important characteristic. And I think churches sometimes kind of become 
oh, more sedentary and it's not such a big deal, at least it is with some. And some people are pretty ambitious and aggressive to try to do that, and some are not so aggressive. And I think sometimes we have fear, well, we're going to say something, the wrong thing. And uh, I say the wrong thing about every day, you know. I, I, that's the difficulty I deal with. But I think my heart's in the right place. I really intend to say things to encourage people, and I try to do that, and sometimes perhaps I overdo it. <clears throat> Spiritual gifts were given or are given for the edification of the church, and we'll talk more about this next week, but I would just like to introduce this to you, Romans 12. But since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, how are the gifts given? According to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to his proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. He who teaches, in his teaching. He who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives, in liberality, with liberality. He who leads, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. So, uh, I want to talk more about these next week, and I'd really like to get into a rather in-depth study of the, the spiritual gifts. But for, the, for just let it say let right now, these gifts are given by the grace of God. If you have the gift to be encouragement, give encouragement to people, and you don't use it, it seems to me that God has given you something, you've rejected it. How would you, how, what do you think of that? So we get, to, we get to the point, I talked to a lady years and years ago. She, she was a member of my faithful year, member of the church for years. And she said, uh, talked to her one time. This is nobody that's here today, but it was, she was a lady that, that uh, she had said she taught Bible class and she'd help go down and turn, get the fire going for Sunday morning. And she was really active. But she came to a point in her life, she said, that's it, I ain't doing no more. And when you get this kind of color of your hair, you have a tendency, I think, sometimes to say, you know, you don't really say those words, but you kind of can get to the point, I ain't doing nothing no more, you see. Well, I don't believe you can say, I ain't doing nothing no more until they put you in the box or until your health dictates the fact that you can't. Now, there's all kinds of things that would be, you know, would impede us to be active in trying to serve the Lord. Uh, but in t attendance is really important. Please don't misunderstand that. But there's more to serving Jesus Christ than just coming and being here. Are you okay with that? Did I, I, I think that's what I would like to say about that. Okay, so I, we'll talk more about this next week, Lord willing. I, that's, my, that's my goal. So all elements in worship also ought to contribute to our edification. Now this, this talks about miraculous spiritual gifts that were given to certain individuals in the New Testament church by the apostles laying their hands on them. But the conclusion is still the same. So <clears throat> what is the outcome then? Brethren, when you assemble, each one has a psalm or each a teaching or a revelation. One has a tongue or an interpretation. But he concludes, let all things be done in for edification. So every time we assemble to the worship, uh, I see that Sunday morning, I see that Sunday night, I see that Wednesday night. Our activities ought to lead us that when we go home, we feel like, I believe, I've been edified by being here. Now, I cannot come in and sit down here and say, well, that's all the teacher's responsibility or that's all the preacher's responsibility. I have a responsibility in that as well. I have to be willing, I have to open my, my mind to be willing to be edified. Now I can choose to do that or I can choose not to do that. I can choose to be here and I think we're all trying to be here. So I think all of you that are here tonight, I believe your hearts are good and you're open and so we just need to focus on some of the things that perhaps that I would think might be important. And so a church at peace, I believe these are characteristics we'll really need to be pursuing. Edification also involves demonstrating love. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we have all knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Love builds up. And so love is something you demonstrate. 
Love is something that I can't put in my pocket and take home and say, you know, boy, I got love. Love means nothing unless you expose it to somebody. You're demonstrating it. Uh, I've heard guys say at times when they got married, you say they'd tell their wife once they loved me, and they never told them again and say, you know, I'll tell you if I change my mind. I've heard that. I think that's kind of stupid myself, but I, I, I think it's something you say every day. Every day is really important. Today might be your last day. Tell your wife or your husband that you love them. I think that's really big time. I guess it could be overdone. Maybe four or five times a day might be a little bit too much, but it hadn't been too much for me. So it's, it's important. So I think that's how we demonstrate love. We, it's put into use, put into practice. If you don't do that, then there's really not much love demonstrated. So uh, the word picture here is uh, for identification. It's, a tra it's like travelers who are going to a place who are walking into the right path to get there. Christians are, in a sense, traveling to another country, to a heavenly country. We're on our way. You see, that's the importance. It's like a road map. I, we were uh, uh, on the telephone. We had my son and his family lived in Elkhart, Kansas, and they have moved. He changed jobs, and they moved to La Mesa, Texas. And that's down uh, They actually live in somewhere between La Mesa and Klondike, and... Klondike is not Western Canada, it's Klondike, Texas, named after <laughs> the gold rush in the Klondike I read. But anyhow, we were on the phone with them, and they was trying to, we were on, the, on some of the maps on you, uh, Yahoo, no Google map. And we were looking, and we were seeing down the roads, and finally, we finally come to, we could see their house where they're moving into. And it was really interesting to me because on the north side of their house, was a field that looked like rose. It almost looked like corduroy material. Those rows were perfectly straight. I presume that was a crop of some sort. Surely it was. And on the south side of their place, another row, another a field, not just a row, a field. And they were perfectly straight. And I thought, boy, those people that live out there in West Texas know how to plow straight lines and plant straight fields. It looked like just like you'd laid a, car, a corduroy garment out there, and those, you know, the fabric of corduroy. That's the way it looked to me. But I thought it was kind of impressive. I found out where they're going in terms of living, but we got to really make sure we know where we're all going in terms of how we live spiritually. You see, so that becomes pretty important, I think. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is going on in the fear of the Lord. So we've talked about being built up. I'd like to talk about going on in the fear of the Lord. What would that mean? Uh, so... Going on has a sense of living. The word often is used to denote Christian conduct and manner of life. So we're going on. We're on that path. We're headed to heaven. And I, we don't want to be sidetracked one way or the other. That's our path. That's, the, that's where we're headed. And so that's important to pursue that, I think. And most all of us surely we do. The right path for them is to walk in the fear of the Lord that is reverence for him and obeying his commandments. I think sometimes we talk about the fear of the Lord and we probably don't give that as much credit as we really ought to. I think the proper attitude for believers toward God is often said to be respect or reverence or awe rather than fear. We respect God. We reverence God. God is an awesome God we talk about once in a while. But in your life, is there any fear of God? You see, I believe, that's, I believe that's a characteristic we sometimes overlook. And we've overlooked it, I suppose, because nobody wants to tell anybody that you may be on your way to hell. <laughs> we don't want to tell anybody that. And for all of us that are faithful Christians, you know, we've, you know, Romans 8 talks about there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ, but that's not the whole story. That's not the only picture. Dayton, please.
You must have stopped at all the stop signs. There's nothing fearful about coming here. Yeah. In fact, there could also be the heat in all the humidity. But I think there's some fear for me to be right here. The older I get, the more I think how far I'm coming. Yeah. Well, you may. Yeah, you may be. My thought on that is, I'm not. So, I'm not afraid. But the kind of fear that I have is that I might not be doing as well as my Lord would expect me to do. That's the kind of, that's what I, once in a while, that, that kind of bothers me. My fear is I may not do it like you do. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's the right. Yeah, Roy, please. That's the way I feel sometimes. I feel I'm not just good enough and I'm not good enough. And, you know, am I doing good enough? And I'm afraid because he's the one who decides where you're going to go. He's the judge. And the ones, when he says that when I return, the earth will mourn, the ones that are lost are going to be wailing and bawling and begging because of the fear they see when they see him. But the saints, you know, every day I ask myself if I'm doing good enough. And I'm like you, Harold. I'm, you know, I'm a, I worry that I'm not doing good enough. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, the uh, things that kind of bother me is uh, am I doing enough with my children or my grandchildren or my, you know, is that the kind, am I doing what I really think I would really want to do if I got down here and I get to be 90 and I look back and have I really done what I could, you see? Have I used the gift that God has given me in order to try to encourage them? Have I talked to other people about Jesus? Right? Yeah, that's an important point too, yeah. But um, more closely to my heart would be, you know, my family is really important to me and, and uh, so those are those are the kind of things that I kind of fear. I, I don't think I worry about God saving my soul, but I, I think I, I do have some sort of fear in my life that am I really trying to live up to what God has given me the opportunity to do? And am I making that influence as much known as I can with those that I can't? Did you have an announcement? Yeah, um, Bobby called. She wants uh, y'all to pray for her before class ends. I gave one to Marty and the other class. She broke her foot and she just left. She called at 725 and she was just, they were just now letting her go home. So okay. She just wanted everybody to pray for her. Okay. Her, uh, well, we'll just do that right now. We're going to do a, a side step here in just a minute. Uh, this is about Bobby Poindexter and says, Bobby uh, broke her foot today and is in a lot of pain. Please pray for her for, to, for the pain to ease. She called the church about 725, was just leaving to go home. So let's pray for Bobby Poindexter, if you would, please. Our gracious Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for many, many ways we're blessed. And for this lady that's requested our praying, we will, we're praying, Father, and we're asking you to bless her that there might be uh, goodness in, her, in the recovery of her health and that uh, she might be able to... Uh, make this recovery without a lot of pain and difficulties, and please bless her, Father, and keep her in care for her. And uh, we, while we're at this, Father, we want to remember D.W. Coyle and help him, and we're praying for each day being a better day for him, and Mary Coffey for her recovery. We're praying that's good. And for uh, uh, Jim McCray, we're praying you'd bless him, Father, and he has a lot of pains and aches too. So oh, there's people that need our help, Father. They need encouragement. A telephone call would be a really a great thing. Please, please help us. Help, help us to be an encouragement to each one as we can, Father. Please. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for joining with me in that. Uh, uh, confining the believer's attitude toward God to be reverence or awe rather than fear may lose sight of some of the aspect of the divine character that compels obedience. Uh, that is, his perfect holiness and righteousness and his unlimited knowledge and power. Knowing that the wrath of God has been satisfied for Jesus Christ believes the, the, uh, relieves the believer to fear condemnation, but not from accountability. You see, do you see what I'm trying to get to? We can look at Romans chapter 8, it says there's no condemnation to in Christ, but... That would mean we'd be saved, but then there's some accountability associated with that to some degree, and I would uh, like to talk about that a little bit. Second uh, Corinthians 5 said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. <coughs> According
according to what he hath done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, if we're going to all appear, this could be that there are those people that are bad, bad meaning not giving any allegiance to Jesus Christ, or good, those people that were committed to following, serving Jesus Christ. It could be understood that way, I suppose. Paul wrote to Timothy and says, Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest may be fearful of sinning. Sometimes that is one useful way when we have people that are that continue in sin. So that's, that's what uh, Timothy was told. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilements of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness, how? In the fear of God. I just There's an aspect of fear of God that I believe really stays with us. And it's not fear that... Uh, that I'm going to be really badly mistreated, but it's fear that maybe personally with me, I'm not doing what I really could be doing. And that becomes a problem. And now, are you doing what you could be doing? I think that's the kind of the aspect that seems to make sense to me. First Peter 1 says, If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, now that seems to be that we're talking about people that are in Christ. Conduct yourselves with fear during the time of your stay on the earth. So we see to fear God is to have allegiance to Him and consequently to His instructions. His instructions are really significant. And thus that affects one's values and convictions and behavior. We may have talked about this not maybe last time, but a time or two ago. You've got, you know, this, when I read this, this is so cutting to the core, I think. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. Now, the, first, the chapter starts off, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to, and then he gets down and says, for it is just like, the kingdom of heaven is just like the man uh, about to go into a journey, and he calls his own slaves and he entrusts them with his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to anyone on his journey. God gives us gifts according to our abilities. Plain and simple, I would see it that way. You might see it differently, but bear with me. You shall see the benefit of what this teaches, I believe. And immediately the one who received five talents went and traded with them and gained five more. In the same way, the one who had received two talents gained two more. But he who received one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. So we're talking about money, of course, but then there's, there's, there's an application to this. The application is how do I serve Jesus Christ? What is my commitment to him? And how do I pursue that? I think that's the important point. Now after a long time, the master of the slaves came and to settle accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And his master said, Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been faithful a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Now where does that take place? Well, if I look at the end... What happens to the one that had one talent and didn't use it? He's cast away into what I would call the punishments of the destruction of eternity. That's what I see this to be, the other side of that. If you've done well, enter into the, the joy of your master. I believe that's the judgment. So there will be those that applied themselves and tried to do what God wanted to do the best they could with whatever talents God gave them. He says, you've done well. Now, not everybody has the same level of talents, of course. The one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you have entrusted two talents with me. See, I've gained two more. And what did his master say? He said, well done, good and faithful slave. You've been faithful a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I believe that's, I believe that's heaven. And it's repaired for those that are certainly in Jesus Christ. But I believe there's, I believe personally that there's things that are going to be assigned to us when we get to heaven. 
Yeah, you might say, well, I don't know if I agree with that. That's my feelings on the matter. That's my understanding on the matter. But if that's not, if that's not what this is about, then I'm not really sure how to apply it, you see. So uh, that would be what I would be trying to say to you. And the one also who had received one talent came up and said, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. I was afraid. If you've got a talent God has given you by the grace of God and you're afraid to use it, where do you fit in this, this parable? You see what I'm kind of leading to? Where do you fit? Well, all we can do is use what God has given us. I cannot do what God has not given me, but what He has given me in terms of gifts, I really need to put that to use. I, that's the way I would really understand it. This man said, I was afraid, and I went, and hid the, uh, I went away and, and hid your talent in the ground. See here, give it back to you. That total rejection of what he was given, as I would see it. But the master answered and said, you wicked, lazy slave. How would God address you and me if we're not applying what talent he's given us? You see the point? It's a powerful lesson in my understanding of this parable that really gives us some insight. You know that I that reap where I did not sow, gather where I had no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in a bank where when I arrived you would have got money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. So you have a talent given to you and you don't choose to use it, you lose it. You know, I heard use or lose, you heard that kind of thing. You've got to you exercise, you use, you use your muscles and your physical body or you lose it. And I guess we do that as long as we can. <clears throat> For everyone who has, more will be given, those who will have it, and he will have an abundance. For the one who does not have, even what he does will be taken away. Throw the worthless slave in the outer darkness, in a place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I understand that to be the result of judgment. So, what do you think? Well, let me give you some thoughts. This parable is about the kingdom of heaven. It is about how to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Oftentimes we wonder, how, how will I be prepared? One prepares for the coming of Jesus by doing the will of Jesus and using his abilities to the glory of God. It is not one's talent that matters, but how he uses them. So I think that's pretty important. The Bible teaches that we are stewards God has given everyone abilities which we must use and for which we must give an account. The way one prepares for the coming of Jesus is by using his abilities every day in the service of Christ in some way that you can based on what you've been given. God never demands a person to do something that that person does not have the ability to do. God does demand that each person use his abilities to the fullest. We're not equal in our talents, but we must be equal in our effort. You see the picture there? That's what I think of. That's pretty important, I think. In Christianity, one must act. It is not enough to refrain from sin. One must also act for the Master. Those who do not will be lost. I believe that's what that parable teaches. That's how I would understand that. An important question for one to ask is, of what use am I to the Master? You ever sat down and thought, well, what, just what use am I? Well, that could be really depressing. But I believe it's a soul-searching consideration. What use am I? So the point of the parable is that everyone is to be faithful in using the opportunities for service that the Lord has given him. The way one watches for the coming of the Lord is by being busy in his service. Reverence and respect, walking in the fear of the Lord, using the gift that God has given us. Dayton, please. In that first passage that we looked at in Acts 9, 31, it mentioned walking in the fear of the Lord. What we haven't touched on is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know for sure what that means, but here's what I think it means. Jesus had told the apostles that when the Spirit came, Mm-hmm. 
Oh, amen to that. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when we're baptized, we get the whole gift of the Holy Spirit given to us. That's the Holy Spirit himself given. Not, not, a, not that he wraps up a package and says, here it is. He gives himself to us. And so I think there's a, a great deal of comfort. Uh, Dayton's talked about the scriptures that the Holy Spirit gives us. There's a number of functions that we, that Dayton talked about in last semester class, about last quarter, about what the Holy Spirit does in his act, action in our lives. Some pretty powerful stuff. One of these was in the, we walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Uh, part of the comfort I see is, uh, personally, is when I'm trying to do what God wants me to do, I feel pretty good about that. Don't you? Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's a real encouragement to me. I'm trying to do it, and I know I'm trying to do it. That's a real encouragement. Now, the, on the other hand, if I have fear, it's because I just sometimes don't think I'm really doing all I could. And that may be true, too. It may be true with all of us, I suppose. I don't think there's probably any of us that we give our full attention and we're doing everything that we possibly could for service to the Lord. But we need to work towards doing what we can. That's, that's the key. Health limitations at times become a concern. You know, there's a, there's a number of reasons why we've, uh, sometimes we're kind of wore out, really, physically. And sometimes, like me, kind of wore out mentally, I think. Maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I, I do believe that this is an important lesson, and so if we're going to be a church at peace, we need to be focusing on being built up, being edified, if you would, and walking in the fear of the Lord, reverencing God, doing uh, certainly obeying commandments as best we can. And so I think that's important. Thank you. Aaron. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that's really true. The, the, the way I seem to know about, I, I try to read what the scriptures teach, and I say, am I doing what I believe the best, best I can, the script, what they teach? If I'm not, my conscience is saying, you know, Harold, you need to shape up a little bit, boy. Now, maybe that's the, what you're talking about. That's how I would see that. Well, that's you, you were in the Navy. What what else could you expect? <laughs> My group was part of the Navy, by the way. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Glad you're here. Appreciate your attention. Well, you're very kind. Thank you.